Welcome to Lesson 1B, Classification of Fluid Flows. In this lesson, we'll discuss various ways to classify fluid flows. We'll define something called the no-slip condition, and we'll define Mach number and do an example problem. First, let's talk about viscous versus inviscid regions of flow. For a fluid, the term viscous refers to when there is friction between fluid particles. We'll talk about viscosity later. The word inviscid is really kind of a misnomer. Inviscid does not mean that the fluid has no viscosity. Instead, inviscid means that viscous effects are negligible compared to inertial or pressure effects. But viscous effects are always important near a wall. It turns out that at a wall, the velocity of the fluid must equal the velocity of the wall. Consider, for example, a car that's moving at v car equal 60 miles per hour. At any point along this wall, the body of the car, v of the air, right at any of these points along the wall, must be identical, that namely 60 miles per hour. This is true at any point along the surface of this vehicle. In other words, the air moves with the car. If you were running this in a wind tunnel, velocity of the car is zero. It's stationary in the wind tunnel, but the wind hitting it is at 60 miles per hour. In that case, at any point along the surface, v has to equal zero. This is a simple change of the frame of reference. We see that in either case, whether the car is moving relative to the air or the wind is moving relative to the car, the fluid has to have the same speed, same velocity, that means speed and direction, of car itself. This equation that V fluid has to equal V wall, those are vectors, is called the no slip condition, which means there can't be a slip of the air relative to the wall. So let's return to our discussion of viscous versus inviscid regions. I'm calling it regions now and you'll see why. Very near the wall, viscous effects are always important, but away from the wall, viscous effects can be negligible. So we need to talk about regions where the flow is either viscous or inviscid. So fluid near a wall is influenced strongly by friction, this would be a viscous region, whereas fluid away from a wall is not strongly influenced by friction. We'd call that an inviscid region. Viscous effects are due to a fluid property that's called viscosity. It's given the Greek symbol mu. We'll discuss viscosity in more detail later. I want to define now something called a boundary layer, which will be very important in fluid mechanics. If you have some kind of a flow, say the hood of our car, in a wind tunnel, and you have some speed hitting it, as we've said before, anywhere along this wall, the speed has to equal the speed of the wall. The wall speed here is zero. What happens is you get a thin layer of viscous fluid, which is called a boundary layer. The velocity very rapidly goes from zero to whatever speed is out here. And by the no-slip condition, the velocity has to be zero at the wall. In terms of regions, this region inside the boundary layer is a viscous region of the flow. Whereas out here away from the wall, we can approximate this as an inviscid region of the flow. Again, keep in mind that inviscid does not mean the fluid has no viscosity. All fluids have viscosity. It's just that those viscous effects are not significant in that region. In fact, we can define a boundary layer, which I will from now on abbreviate as just BL. Boundary layer is defined as a thin layer near a wall where viscous effects are significant. You can actually have boundary layers without walls, but we're not going to go into that much detail right now. Here's a sketch of a car with a boundary layer. You can see that this is exaggerated actually. The boundary layer would in real life be more th thin than this. Everything in the boundary layer would be the viscous region. and Everything outside the boundary layer would be the inviscid region. Later on in the course we'll be able to calculate things like this velocity profile through boundary layer. The second classification is internal versus external flow. This is a lot easier to explain and understand. Internal flow simply means it's confined by walls or between walls. Some examples would be pipe flow or flow through a valve. That's internal flow. External flow is the opposite, flow not confined by walls. That doesn't mean necessarily that there's no walls in the flow. For example, we'd consider flow over a car an external flow even though there's a ground. That's a wall. Or even in a wind tunnel, here's a tennis ball in a wind tunnel, there's going to be walls that define the test section of the wind tunnel, but as long as those walls are far away, they don't affect the flow over this ball. 
So we would still call this an external flow. So you can have some walls, but they're far away as in that case, or simply part of the flow field as in the car case. Unless the car is flying off a cliff, it always has a wall underneath it. Next, we'll talk about compressible versus incompressible flow. If the density, which we use the symbol rho, which is mass over volume of the fluid, is approximately constant, we call that incompressible. We call it compressible if changes in density are significant. I want to comment here about my notation. When I have a capital V like that, that means speed. If you put an arrow over it, it means velocity, which is speed along with the direction. It's a vector. I draw V with a line through it to mean volume. So you'll see this notation when I write things out to mean volume. In the textbook, there's kind of a script looking different font for V as volume compared to speed. So you just have to get used to that in the book. Let's define a very important parameter in fluid flow called the Mach number, MA. Some textbooks just use M. We use MA in the Chengao Symbol of Fluid book. This is a non-dimensional parameter equal to the speed over the speed of sound. So V is the speed of the fluid itself and C is the speed of sound in that fluid. Mach number is important to decide whether the flow is compressible or whether we can approximate it as incompressible. A good rule of thumb is that rho changes by about 5% when the Mach number is about 0.3. So we can say that if the Mach number is less than about 0.3, we approximate the flow as incompressible. So that's a good rule of thumb to remember. Going back to the previous lesson, this is why you can approximate flows in air by modeling them in a test with a water tunnel with water, but only when the air is not flowing very fast. Up to about Mach number of 0.3, we can do stuff like that. If the Mach number is greater than 0.3, we start to get more than about 5% air, which starts to be fairly significant. Note that air is a compressible fluid. It can be approximated as an ideal gas, where density is changing with pressure and temperature, but we can approximate it as incompressible at low Mach number. Keep in mind that that is an approximation. Liquids, however, are almost always approximated as incompressible. Here are some examples. A river meandering through the land is incompressible. That's a liquid. A small plane like the one shown here that might fly at maybe 100 miles per hour is still low speed. The Mach number would be much less than 0.3. Some examples of compressible flow. Here's a cool Schlieren image of a balloon exploding, and you could see things like a shock wave forming here that expands out. This is definitely compressible. This is an unsteady flow, and this shock wave is moving radially outward from this explosion. If the velocity is greater than the speed of sound, the Mach number which is V over C is greater than one. We call that supersonic. Supersonic flow is highly compressible. Here's an example of the space shuttle in a wind tunnel at a supersonic Mach number, and this is called an oblique shock. The wind tunnel here is operating at supersonic flow. When we talk about compressibility in air, air is approximated as an ideal gas. We're going to talk about the speed of sound without going through the derivation. C is the speed of sound. Some books use A instead. For an ideal gas, C is the square root of KRT where K is the ratio of specific heats, Cp over Cv, and R is called the specific gas constant. Don't confuse R with Ru. Ru is the universal gas constant, and you divide by molecular weight to get the specific gas constant. Let's do a quick example. Let's take air at 20 degrees C. We'll typically be talking about air. Let's calculate the speed of sound. So I would use my equation from above, C equals square root of KRT. Using my definition of R, this is KRU over M molecular weight of the air times T. And now let's plug in our numbers. We have square root K for air is 1.40. This is on your equation sheet, by the way. Also on the equation sheet is universal gas constant, 8.314 kilojoule per kilomole K Kelvin. Molecular weight of air from the equation sheet is 28.97 kilogram per kilomole. Now be careful, this T must be an absolute temperature, not Celsius. It has to be in K in this case in the metric system. So we have to convert 20.0 plus 273.15, that gives us K. Now we need to do some unit conversions. A kilonewton meter is the definition of a kilojoule, that's energy, 
work times distance. That gets rid of kilojoules there. Ks are gone. Kilomoles are gone. Now we have kilonewtons and kilograms and meters. So we need another unity conversion factor, 1,000 kilogram meter per second squared kilonewton. That just comes from Newton's second law. A newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So a kilonewton is a 1,000 kilogram meters per second squared. We can cross out kilonewton. Now we can cross out kilogram. So all we have left is two meters on the top and the second squared on the bottom. When you take the square root, that gives us meters per second, which is what we want. Plug in your calculator. C is 343.19 meters per second. I always give my answers, unless specified otherwise, to three significant digits. But I'll keep these five here for use in the next example problem to avoid round off error. Notice that these two are what we call unity or unit conversion factors or ratios. These are by definition one. That's equal to one and that's equal to one. They're just unit conversions so you can multiply one by anything else in your equation and you don't change it. That's why we call it unity conversion ratios. I would strongly advise you to do your units like I just did here. Not just in this course but in all of your courses and in all of your life so that you don't mess up your units. So this is the speed of sound in air at 20 degrees C. Now we can do another example with Mach number. In this example we have a military military jet flying at a certain speed in miles per hour through the atmosphere, this is air, where the temperature is 20 degrees C. We want to calculate the Mach number and determine whether this flow is subsonic or supersonic, and whether it's compressible or nearly incompressible where we can ignore compressibility. V is 464 miles per hour. C is 343.19 meters per second. This comes from the previous example, since it's at the same temperature. So that's the previous page. The Mach number is then defined as V over C. Again, always put in your units with your numbers. 464 miles per hour, 343.19 meters per second. We have to convert miles per hour to meters per second. Most students just look this up on the internet, but the proper way to do this is to convert units using unity conversion factors. One hour is 3600 seconds, 60 times 60. And then 1609.3 meters is equivalent to a mile. Again, both of these are unity conversion ratios. When I plug this into my calculator, I get 0. 60440. Notice that all the units cancel, miles cancel, meters cancel, seconds cancel, and hours cancel. So this is no units, which sometimes is indicated this way, but if you just leave the number by itself, that implies there's no units. So my final answer is Mach number is 0.604 to three digits. Notice that I kept this to about five digits here just to avoid round off error. But my final answer is three significant digits since I'm limited by three digits in the given information. Well, to answer the question, we've calculated the Mach number. Is this subsonic or supersonic? And is it compressible or nearly incompressible? Well, obviously, since Mach number is less than one, it's subsonic. Since Mach number is greater than 0.3, this is compressible. Tying in with the previous lesson, if you run this experiment in a liquid like water with a model, you could have significant error in any kind of measurements you make because this water is incompressible or approximated as incompressible, whereas the air itself here is compressible and the, this flow, the Mach number, is high enough that compressibility effects are important. Okay, moving on, let's talk about laminar versus turbulent flow. Laminar, the very word is from lamin which means smooth and orderly, like a laminate, typically steady, but it can be unsteady as long as it's smooth and orderly. Whereas turbulent flow is chaotic, it's always unsteady, and there's random eddies or vortices in the flow. So a laminar flow might look like this. You have these nice this nice flow, whereas a turbulent flow would have all these eddies moving around and it's unsteady and chaotic. You can see this in water flowing from a tube. Here's a picture of laminar flow from a tube compared to turbulent flow from that same tube. Typically, this is at low speed, whereas this is typically at high speed. We're talking about water here, so this is still approximated as incompressible, but you can have laminar versus turbulent flow. I mentioned that turbulent flow is unsteady, but I want to comment that a turbulent flow can be steady in the mean. For example, this pipe flow is steady in the mean, even though there's lots of eddies and vortices all over this thing that are unsteady. Okay, quickly through the rest of these, natural versus forced, that's kind of obvious. Natural flow means there's no fan or anything forcing the flow. It just happens by itself. For example, flow just due to convection, thermal convection, 
versus forced. There's a fan, or in this case, a swimmer. There's muscles that are moving someone, propelling this person, forcing the flow. If this person just sits still, he or she will stop. Steady versus unsteady, we've already kind of talked about. This is a highly unsteady waterfall here with lots of turbulent eddies. But if you have a long time exposure, it looks steady. It's actually steady in the mean. Whereas this unsteady picture is an instantaneous snapshot photograph. Some flows, like flow from a, just a floor fan, can also be steady in the mean. But if you take an instantaneous flow, you would see some kind of lobes of the flow with turbulent eddies, etc., around each of these blades in a cyclic pattern. It's not really steady, but in a long-term kind of view, it's steady in the mean. Finally, let's talk about one, two, or three-dimensional flows. Flow over a car is definitely three-dimensional. By that, we mean that the velocity field is a function of three spatial dimensions x, y, and z. It's a three-dimensional geometry and a three-dimensional flow. Flow over this antenna here, however, is safe between some section of it, not near the wall and not near the end, can be approximated as two-dimensional. It's a function of only two spatial variables, for example, r and theta. If you look at a cross-sectional view you see a cylinder with flow coming at it, and you'll get some vortices shed from it like this. But you'll have this kind of two-dimensional wake that's only a function of, in this case, x and y. Let's look at pipe flow as another example. This is also a 2D flow. Near the entrance here, the velocity is a function of r and z. z is the direction down the pipe, and r is the radius. You see that this flow is changing until we reach a certain point here where we call it fully developed, and the velocity profile does not change anymore after that. So in this region, v is a function of radius only. So this part of the flow is actually one-dimensional, whereas this part is two-dimensional. In terms of pressure, and we'll talk about pipe flow a lot later on in the course, it turns out that p is a function of z only, if we neglect gravity. p is a function of z only, in other words, it varies it decreases with this direction down the pipe. So that's also 1D. So pipe flow, fully developed pipe flow, has an interesting characteristic. The velocity field is 1D, function of R only. Pressure is 1D, a function of Z only. Another example would be flow over a bullet or any other kind of axisymmetric body. So in this case, V is a function of radius and downstream direction Z. V is not a function of this variable theta, which is just the angle around, since it's axisymmetric. So this would be 2D flow. If this were at an angle of attack, however, the flow would be a function of theta, so that would have to be fully 3D. So kind of in summary, 3D flow is velocity being a function of three variables. I say velocity, but pressure, temperature, other things can be functions of three variables to be 3D. 2D V is a function of two variables, and 1D V is a function of one variable. And I've shown you examples of all these cases here. Most of the stuff we do in this course will be two-dimensional. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.